Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar on application integration for smart cities. So I'm Erin Lemke and I lead the product marketing team here at Safe Software. And with me today I have my colleagues Dave Patterson, who's an account manager and specializes in local government, and Nathan Hildebrand, an FME applications analyst. Um, as we go along, we'll be answering your questions live in the questions panel. So feel free to send in any questions as they come to you. We'll do our best to answer them during the webinar. And if we don't get to yours, we'll be sure to send you an answer afterwards. We're going to talk about application integration and why local governments are implementing this type of logic into their initiatives to power smart city projects and increase efficiency. Then we'll provide some practical examples being implemented by cities today. And then next we'll share a how-to for building API access for applications using our software platform FME. We'll then provide a few more practical examples for ideas and then dive into a CityWorks demo where we'll show you how this can be accomplished using FME. We'll close with time for Q&A and we'll share some highlights of the questions that have come in during the webinar at that time. So before we get started, I'll share a little bit about who we are and why we're speaking about application integration in the first place. Here at Safe Software, everything we do is motivated by our mission, which is to help organizations maximize the value of their data. So our company was founded 25 years ago by Don Murray and Dale Lutz. They recognized that local companies were encountering a lot of data challenges in 1993, and they set out to help. Today, our data, our data integration platform, FME, enables over 10,000 organizations worldwide to use and share their data where, when, and how it's needed. FME is known for its ability to address the complex challenges posed by location information and provides the best support for spatial data in the world. And we're a software vendor, so services are offered by our network of over 150 partners. Our FME platform enables you to connect data between applications using a visual interface. It offers a large library of connectors and transformers which enable data to be used and shared in whatever applications are best fit for your purpose. So you can configure FME to automate your integration workflows, running them on schedules and in response to events, such as an update to a database or an incoming email. You can also automate workflows to send notifications via SMS, email or various web protocols. Automation enables you to integrate data in flexible ways beyond application integration. So for example, you can set up a data upload service that provides validation and a detailed pass-fail report, which accepts past data, or you could securely provide data however it's needed for self-serve access, such as an open data initiative. We offer flexible deployment options. We have FME Desktop, which is the authoring environment. That's where you build your data integration workflows. And automation can be provided in FME Server, which is deployed on-premises or in the cloud. We also offer FME Server deployed in a fully hosted AWS cloud environment called FME Cloud. So now we're going to ask our first poll question. Do you use FME today? So you can let us know if you've been using it for more than five years or for one to five years, less than a year, or not at all yet. Yeah, so we see a pretty good split. We've got um, quite a few of you that are using it between one and five years or more than five years, and a substantial amount of you as well that are just new to FME. So welcome, and I hope you learn a lot and get inspired by this. And those of you who have been using it for a long time, I hope you get some new ideas. So let's focus in now on application integration for smart cities. We're recognizing a significant trend towards smart city initiatives that aim to provide a better quality of life for their citizens. This includes environment, social, financial aspects of urban life, and the movement is also being driven by a desire for increased sustainability. The Smart Cities Council describes that a smart city applies information and communications technology, or ICT, to solve problems. And examples of this are being demonstrated using everything from autonomous public transportation and IoT, or Internet of Things streetlights, to increased snowplow efficiency, to stream gauge sensors that provide advanced flood warning. In their Smart Cities framework, they describe technology enablers, two of which are connectivity and interoperability. So why are these enablers so critical to the success of Smart City initiatives? Well, the world's most valuable resource is no longer oil, but data, as The Economist published in 2017. And Bala Afshar added to that concept last year when he tweeted, Data is the oil of the 21st century, but oil is just useless thick goop until you refine it into fuel. Organizations spend a lot of money on building their data sets and installing sensors to collect information from connected things, but data is only as valuable as it's used. Data silos are in place in every city, usually due to financial restraints by project or the long-standing tradition of dividing city departments by function. In reality, each area of specialty at the city should be able to use the best fit for purpose application, 
but the data they need access to is often stored in a way that either makes this impossible or makes it extremely difficult to share across teams. If it is done, it's often a custom-built solution that may break with the next update or may, may make updating requirements extremely costly. So an automated application integration workflow is critical, whether you're creating work orders or scheduling lessons, billing in financial systems, creating permits, delivering open data, or enabling citizens to report something that seems simple, like a pothole, your data needs to flow freely between applications to get the job done efficiently. So by implementing application integration, you're enabling city staff to use the best fit for purpose applications for your smart city initiatives and to focus their efforts on innovation rather than repetitive integration tasks. So now we're gonna take a look at some recent examples of how our customers are using application integration to power smart city initiatives with our FME data integration platform. And Dave's gonna share those with us now. Thanks, Erin. Um, I'd like to highlight uh, some examples where customers are using the FME platform for application integration. Our business partner, Spatial DNA, based in Ontario, has been working with the Township of Lang Langley to enable the bi-directional exchange of data across systems. They now have a workflow that dramatically reduces the manual data entry for their staff as they work to coordinate garbage and compost card exchanges. What used to be several hundred tasks a week is now reduced to about three. They did this by using FME as a message broker to integrate Microsoft Dynamics CRM, their call center, uh, billing, with their Tempest system and address validation with Esri and the work management platform for the third party contractor who performs the delivery and exchange of garbage and compost cards. By, enable, by enabling the systems to exchange data, the need for a human to pro perform this effort is eliminated. The city staff can now accomplish far more. Over in Quebec, our partner Concertech is working with the city of Port Coquitlam to replace PHP ETL processes with with FME to integrate data between their financial system, which is unit four, their recreational system with ActiveNet, taxation with Tempest, and banking transactions with PCART. The goal is to replace the existing, existing custom coded solution with FME and take advantage of its scalability and graphical interface. When using a drag and drop interface to build integration, the workflows are self-documenting and can be more easily updated as requirements change and new applications need to be added. Great, thanks Dave and Aaron. So let's change gears a little bit here, and I'm going to jump into uh, how to start building uh, API access. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what an API is. I'm going to focus uh, specifically on REST APIs. Uh, this is what we're most often seeing customers working with. Uh, it's what I've been working with the most in FME. And they're quite wide widespread and often uh, publicly accessible or uh, easy to connect to. I'll show some examples and key transformers, and I'll go over some best practices for developing API integrations. So what is an API? So API stands for Application Programming Interface. It's really just a method of communicating programmatically with tools and functions that are already predefined and built. They're often part of larger applications or software packages, and you're often communicating with a smaller subset of a much larger system. Uh, REST stands for Representational State Transfer. Uh, REST APIs send and receive data through HTTP, which is Hypertext Transfer Protocol. It's a bunch of jargon, but for our needs, just think of it as a system of URL endpoints and associated requests that interface with an application. So in this example you see on the slide here, uh, my app is the application that I'm uh, interacting with. Integrate is my URL REST endpoint. And my request is get me equals data. So JSON is very often the language of this interchange, and it's what's sent in a request and received in the response. It stands for a JavaScript object notation, and it's a lightweight human and computer readable data interchange format, commonly used to transfer data over the web. It's made up of keys, which are kind of like attributes in FME, and values, which are attribute values in FME speak. An example here, JSON is a key, JavaScript object notation is a value, and data is a key and 42 is a value. So parsing is a term you might uh, come into contact with quite a bit when you're working with APIs. Uh, it's basically breaking down a code or a sentence into usable parts. Basically what we're doing is extracting chunks of these JSON keys and values and translating them into useful bits of information. In FME, we generally do this uh, and extract keys and values into attributes and attribute values. 
Uh, this is achieved with a series of JSON transformers that we have and attribute manipulation transformers like attribute creator, attribute exposer, and aggregator. Those are just a few that you'll run into fairly often. There are lots and lots of APIs out there. In terms of publicly accessible web, web APIs alone, there are thousands. And it seems like the trend for both web services and traditional software packages is to expose their API via REST. Here we see just two examples of APIs that are pretty close to home. Uh, on the left, we have FME Server REST API. And on the right, we have the City, CityWorks API. Uh, this is a, t a look at both of those uh, documentations. Uh, they're pretty good and include examples of what kinds of requests to send and what to expect as a response. This is pretty typical for the kind of documentation you'd expect to find with uh, most REST APIs. Okay, great. Let's uh, dive into a little bit of a technical demo here. I'll just switch over to uh, an FME workspace. Cool. So I'll walk you through a couple of sample uh, REST API interactions. Uh, the first one here is uh, going to be interacting with the FME server REST API. One of the most simple calls. I'm just going to uh, pull the FME server uh, with a health check. I basically just want to uh, check if the server is running and if it's OK. So REST API calls are going to have uh, this typical layout. I will have a creator to initiate the stream of uh, data in FME. We'll have an HTTP caller hitting your REST endpoint. And we'll have a series of JSON transformers to parse uh, the response from the server. I'll take a peek at the HTTP caller, and you'll notice my URL endpoint, which is health check. This is a really simple get method. Pretty much all the parameters in here are default. It's really quick to get started with this kind of call. I'll just highlight that I'm using a web connection here in FME, which is really just a saved named authentication to a web service. And these can be predefined, saved, and they really make using the HTTP caller uh, pretty streamlined. So what we would get out of there is a chunk of JSON with a key status and a value OK. It would be uh, wrapped in curly braces and quotation marks. Basically, what the JSON flattener and JSON extractor do is parse that chunk of JSON into what we use in FME, which is usually a feature with attributes and attribute values. The next example is a post HTTP call. This is interacting with an FME server topic. Instead of a GET request, we now have a post. And with a post, we'll send a header, which contains our authentication. This style is token. You might have an OAuth or a different kind of authentication. FME server generally uses the token. And with this post, we'll send a data upload body. And here, we'll send our own JSON to FME server. Here, it's just key and value. I've thrown this example in just to show how interacting with a REST API can get a little bit more complex depending on the response you get from your application. The US Census API is an API I've got quite a bit of experience working with. Uh, it's an open data API. Uh, you can basically query uh, planning databases and census databases for state level, track level, block group level uh, demographic data. Here we see another really simple GET request to the planning database at the track level. We've got a few query string parameters, which are just querying the database for specific subsets of data. Here I've got county name, state name, total population, and census year. We've got a track number, and we've got a state and a county. I'll check and see if this one will run properly. There we go. So if we check the JSON response, We'll notice that this is actually a bit more of a complicated response. It's a nested array. But this just goes to show that however complicated your response is, uh, you can always logically work through it with our JSON transformers and come out with a really simple endpoint, which is just one row for King County, Washington, with a total population. All right, let's just dive back here. So I'll go over a few best practices for working with REST APIs. First, 
and fill out the documentation. Check what data formats and structures your applications use. What kind of authentication do they use? Is it token-based? Is it OAuth, something else? Are there any examples included in the documentation? Get started working with those. Next, work out the authentication if needed. Create a token workflow or web connection in FME. Next, start developing using a client. You can use something like Postman, uh, a free uh, web client. You can use a web browser. Uh, Chrome DevTools are super helpful in this vein. Or you can use an HTTP caller in FME. Next, inspect the results. View the data from successes and practice parsing with FME transformers. Finally, expand. Once you know the pattern, try other calls or methods. Try to make it repeatable and reusable. You can do this by using published parameters in FME or try passing in data using attribute values. And if you can, share. Finally, I've got a few useful links for you guys. Um, if you just search on the Knowledge Center for something like FME API, you'll find tons of resources. Here's a few useful links uh, that I found. There's a couple webinars for working with web services and APIs. There's also a super helpful knowledge uh, base article uh, for working with web services and JSON in uh, FME Desktop. Thanks, Nathan. So now we're going to ask our next poll question, but this time um, you can enter your, enter your answer. Blah, excuse me. <laughs> enter your answer into the chat panel. Um, it's a tongue twister today. Um, so, what applications do you need to integrate? So, um, this might be things like asset management or capital planning, um, permitting or taxation systems, GIS, mobile workforce management or work order management. It might be financial. Um, it might be HR, fleet management. BI, uh, which is business intelligence, CRM like Salesforce, um, citizen facing portals or open data, enterprise search, lesson scheduling, bylaws or licensing. Just let us know in the in the uh, chat panel and you can keep on sending those answers in as we carry on with some more practical examples. All right. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so a couple more examples right here in our right here where our headquarters are located. The city of Surrey has implemented the FME platform to improve data workflows between systems for their water meter process improvement project. Previously, the city relied on complex database integrations, manual workflows, and store procedures with nightly data synchronization jobs. Using the FME platform as an orchestration tool to facilitate the communication between systems, including City Works for Asset Management, Amanda for permitting, and Esri GIS, the city was able to uh, automate their workflows and share data live between these applications. The city is now exploring other use cases for imp implementing FME server, including business intelligence and public safety applications. The city of Omaha in Nebraska is working on a, an interesting project because much of the automation here is within a single application, basically customizing their staff's workflow to reduce repetitive data entry. They wanted to replace the manual digital paperwork that accompanies service requests, inspection orders, work orders, and other mid-level tasks that take place between the opening and closing of the service request, all of which is done in CityWorks. The project runs in their FME cloud instance, and they chose a cloud solution because many of their plan integrations rely on cloud-based systems and web APIs rather than on-premise data warehouses, and because the overhead to get started is so low. This is in line with our recommendations to keep integration workflows close to where the data and applications they serve. If they're cloud, build cloud integrations. If they're on-premise, build on-premise integrations. The project, is, the project is enabling staff to work on higher value tasks than manual data entry. It is so successful that they're currently looking to work with municipal permitting and accounting systems and organizing snowplow routing. Because the integrations are built using a web interface rather than a scripting language, the workflows can be easily updated as requirements change or to add new applications into the mix. All right, thanks, Dave. Let's jump into the uh, CityWorks side of the demos for today. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll give a high-level overview of FME server integrations and the CityWorks uh, integration workflow. Uh, I'll take a closer look at the moving pieces here, including uh, the FME desktop workspace, the FME server notification setup, uh, the CityWorks side of the setup, and then towards the end, I'll do just a tiny little bit of off-roading for one of our uh, newest uh, beta features, which is going to make this whole thing way easier. It's called automations. Just do a quick peek there. So at a high level, FME server uh, has been known uh, for 
long time as a data transfer and uh, transformation tool that shuffles data between traditional formats, especially in the GIS space. But the potential of FME really goes beyond this. Uh, FME can communicate with non-traditional and non-spatial formats and systems, often through a simple HTTP call to an API, as we've talking about. Uh, if you throw in notifications like an email service, as well as uh, database connections, uh, there really isn't a whole lot you can't do for your data enterprise stack. So let's take a look at the CityWorks uh, pipeline, uh, sort of at a high level here. Uh, so this diagram is meant to be sort of a visual abstraction of the processes at work in the integration uh, workflow. Starting at the top left there, the skyscraper icon is supposed to represent uh, CityWorks. That kind of calendar looking thing underneath there is supposed to be a table with data, work orders, forms, et cetera. So starting there, uh, so when an uh, action like a service request creation or a work order or an inspection ticket or something like this is created in CityWorks. Uh, it's going to send uh, some JSON to FME server. So that's the little curly brackets there. That's the JSON. And it's being registered uh, by an FME uh, topic, which we uh, haven't mentioned yet. But a topic acts kind of like a recording device that can register and play back data from HTTP requests. So that's that kind of cache register looking icon there above uh, FME server. So uh, once the topic has registered the message in FME server, it'll kick off an FME engine to run a workspace that's going to ingest the JSON and use it to complete the translation. That's the cog wheel there. So during the workflow, FME is going to pull data from an external database and also make a series of REST API calls back to CityWorks, creating whatever work orders, tasks, uh, entities, et cetera, are needed to complete the original uh, service request or work order ticket, whatever it may be. When the whole process is complete, FME server sends an email summarizing the job. So this gives you a larger picture of what's going on, and I'm gonna dive into some of the nuts and bolts here for uh, the technical details. And bear with me, there's a few moving parts. Uh, so hopefully they'll all work together and we'll be able to uh, see the whole workflow work in action. So here's the uh, FME desktop uh, workspace. Uh, just a second, I'm going to bring up my notes. So it's really just a series of HTTP call calls followed by uh, parsing the response with JSON transformers. Starting at the beginning, uh, the workspace kicks off uh, by reading a JSON feature. It really just contains an address uh, attribute that's been sent over from CityWorks via JSON. Uh, immediately, we're going to authenticate to CityWorks and retrieve a token. And next, we're going to start creating work orders, tasks, and entities. We're going to first create a parent work order. Next, we'll create a child work order from the parent. Next, we'll add a task to that child work order. In this workflow below here, you'll notice that we're doing some geocoding. This is basically because we want to turn that address that came from CityWorks into a real uh, city GIS street center line entity. So what we're doing is geocoding the address uh, grabbing some street center lines from the city uh, geodatabase, finding uh, which one matches the address, and attaching it to the work order as an entity in CityWorks. At the very end, uh, hidden in this bookmark here, uh, I've just rigged up uh, an HTML report to be generated and sent by email as a summary of what happened in the uh, workspace. So all the API calls here are in these orange uh, bookmarks. So there's five of them. We've also got two uh, custom transformers here, which you see in green. So these are transformers which I've already uploaded to FME Hub. So if you're curious at taking a look at them and starting to work with them, uh, search for CityWorks uh, on the Hub, and you'll find the CityWorks connector and work order creator. You can also open these up and actually look at what's going on inside. They're pretty simple. They're basically the same template again an HTTP caller followed by a JSON extractor. 
So I'll take a look at uh, one of these HTTP callers just to show you what it looks like to interact with the CityWorks API. So essentially, we're just hitting uh, a pretty straightforward endpoint. So I'm wanting to create from parent a new work order. And I'm setting a few query string parameters uh, with data just in the format that the CityWorks API accepts. So we have an entity type, work order ID, uh, template ID, and I'm always sending along my token for authentication purposes. All of these are really well outlined in the documentation. Uh, there's many, many more uh, query values you could set in here. These are just the required ones and the ones that we wanted for our workflow. All right, let's jump over to the server side of things. So to enable all this to happen in real time and responsibly in CityWorks, we have to set up a series of topics. So as a recap, we saw the FME desktop workspace here, which uh, starts from a JSON feature sent from CityWorks. So how does that happen? So in FME server, we set up a few topics to orchestrate the uh, real-time CityWorks workflow in FME server. The most important one here is probably the CityWorks trigger. So this is the topic that sits in FME server and listens to the data sent by CityWorks. Uh, we also have uh, a topic for uh, the email. So when, a, when the CityWorks workflow finishes, uh, an email will be sent. That's actually this subscription here, the CityWorks emailer. Uh, it's just using a Gmail protocol, uh, SMT, SMTP. And the other subscription we have is uh, the CityWorks workspace subscription. So this actually work, listens to that first topic, the CityWorks trigger topic, takes the JSON and runs the workspace. So that FME desktop workspace, I just published it with the uh, job submitter service, basically no configuration at all when publishing. All this was done on the FME server side. So we've got about four or five topics and a couple subscriptions to make this whole process uh, responsive. Okay, let's go over to the CityWorks side of things. So in CityWorks, here we're looking at uh, something called Action Manager, which is basically uh, a set of tools for application integration and responsive uh, actions and messaging within CityWorks. So there's two things here that enable this whole workflow to work. It's Action Events and Action Templates. Action Events are uh, events that happen in response to something done in CityWorks, whether it's a uh, case created, request created, uh, work order closed, something like this. So we've designed a workflow to respond to uh, a new request. So here's our uh, event details. So our uh, action event is going to listen for any new request for a uh, K event. It's going to trigger always. And it's going to interact with an action template called FME Server Trigger. So let's take a look at that template. So the template is the action that's taken uh, once the event happens. So here, let's look at the FME Server Trigger action template. Uh, so we've got our URL for FME Server right here. So this is how CityWorks knows to interact with FME Server. Kind of like we saw in the HTTP caller, we have a method. We can choose getter post. Here we've got post because we're going to send data to FME server. In the custom tab here, you can see the custom data upload body that we're going to send. It's going to be application JSON, as we can see from the content type set in the header. And the template is going to be a key address. And the value is going to be this value here, which is actually a data from a f address field entered when the service request is created. So I'll jump over to the service request, and I'll just try to create one and see if we can get this workflow to run for us. So I'm going to create a new request for a Kven. And I'm going to give it an address. Now this address should be sent over to FME server. 
So let's save this. There we go, there it is. Okay, great, so the CityWorks trigger topic has registered uh, the address that I entered into uh, CityWorks. Oh, you just see a new notification here in topic monitoring, which is that the workspace uh, ran as a success. And now if I check my email, I should have some results from my translation. So here I've just sent myself an email with uh, the work orders created, uh, the task, and the entity that I've also created. Okay, that's the CityWorks workflow. Now, I just want to briefly show this new tool called uh, Automations, which uh, is a visual and graphical uh, tool for basically all those topics and notifications I set up earlier. So those four or five topics and two subscriptions that you have to create manually in FME Server are going to become a ton easier uh, in FME Server in the future. So this is pretty beta, it's uh, not totally fleshed out. It's available in the product in 2019. So download the beta, you can play around with it. So basically that whole setup is broken down into just three nodes here. We have a topic, we have an action to run the workspace, I've just chosen the workspace, and I've set here one parameter which is just to use the JSON from the topic. So if you follow the data flow here, it all ends with uh, an email, which is exactly the same as the email subscription I created earlier, but here it's all contained in this automations graphical interface. So I hope that gave you a good overview of the CityWorks integration workflow we've been working on here at SAFE. Don't, uh, just remember that you can search for CityWorks on the FME Hub and find a whole bunch of content there and templates that you can work on. Feel free to leave a comment on the Hub if you have questions or encounter any issues uh, making these templates work for your systems. And also definitely stay tuned for automations. I think it's really going to change the way people use uh, FME server notifications. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, so before we move into our Q&A segment, I have an exciting announcement for you. Um, we'll be introducing optional population-based pricing in the next few months. So this new approach is an alternative that local governments can choose instead of our perpetual pricing model. It offers an annual subscription that provides as many desktop and server licenses and engines as you'd like, and the price is capped at your population size. We're seeing the reach of FME expand in local government becoming the enterprise solution of choice for data integration across both GIS and IT departments, and we're providing this new pricing option to help you deploy the entire FME platform across your city more easily. We're also designing this model to enable smaller populations to deploy the entire FME platform, so the lowest tier will be less than the price of FME server with one engine. This will enable towns to use the same technology that the largest cities use, deploying successful architecture, including test, development, and sandbox environments as needed. So with that, thank you for joining our webinar. Um, we're now going to open up for questions and answers. So if you have any questions, please do send them into your chat panel there. Um, and we'll take a look at some of the highlights that have come in so far. So we don't have any like specific questions about um, how this works or why you would do it, but we do see a lot of um, suggestions as to what kinds of applications you're wanting to integrate, and it is quite um, consistent with what the kinds of things we've been seeing. Hey, Dave? Yeah, absolutely, Aaron. I'm just looking through the list now of, um, uh, of systems that uh, customers are looking for us to support, and they, these are things that we've come across, you know, over the past. Uh, the past year, so things like IBM Maximo is is on our radar. Uh, Infor Tools, Infor is uh, quite a large organization that does asset management and things like permitting and licensing. Um, I see Tyler, uh, Tyler Technologies there as well. Um, so we already support uh, Socrata and we have things like Entergov uh, on our radar. Um, Amanda, uh, of course, you, you saw that uh, during some of the the, the case studies that, uh, for example, like the city of Surrey was already already working with that. So yeah, it's a, it's a great list, and we'll certainly uh, take this and 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 this will help us uh, prioritize um, the systems that we want to support moving forward. And then Nathan, there's a question there about integrating with Cartograph. 
Oh yeah, I'm not uh, I'm not super familiar with Car that. Cartograph's uh, another asset management uh, tool. It's it, uh, it's based on the Esri uh, platform, okay. and so that cer certainly that's another one that we'll be looking at uh, um, as we move forward. Yeah, and so Nathan, can you elaborate on that a little bit too? Like, um, basically, if an application has an API, that certainly is a first step towards um, integrating applications. Right, definitely. Especially if it's a REST API, um, there's really no reason that FME couldn't interact with it. Um, you'll have to just work out uh, how to authenticate and how to uh, formulate your calls and requests. Uh, but uh, you should be able to make it work with HTTP callers in FME. Excellent. And we have another one that came in. Um, the question from Marco is, will the report generator eventually develop into a dashboard builder that can show real-time sensor data? I don't know of any plans uh, for the HTML report generator to go so far. Uh, we do also have dashboards already in FME server. Um, I guess it's possible if that these could be developed further. Um, I think this would be a great idea for our actual ideas forum. Uh, mm -hmm. This is something that you want to see, create an idea, and uh, we'll see how much uh, feedback we can get so we can uh, gauge if we should implement it in the future. That's right, yeah. So if you go to the link that's shown on the screen right now, knowledge.safe.com, um, there's a few different ways you can navigate from there. Um, one of them is the Idea Center where you can go in and post ideas and vote for ideas that you'd like to see in the product. Um, and also, if you want to share ideas with each other about um, how-tos or answer some questions, there's quite an active community as well. Yeah, I've actually heard that some FME fans go on there at lunch just to see if they can be challenged to try and help someone answer a question they're not familiar with themselves yet. So it's quite a, quite a friendly community over there. So are there any other last questions that want to come in before we wrap up the webinar? You're always welcome to reach out to us at live chat on just the safe.com website. It'll pop up in the bottom corner and you can throw questions in there anytime if they come to you later today. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at Safe Software and other social media and um, find out more information in general at safe.com. So feel free to come join us over there. And um, thank you for attending our webinar today. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.